In this video, I tell the story behind my piece, Hubbard Squash. I go into quite a bit of detail here. I'm thinking that you sculpture aficionados out there and students interested in carving will get a kick out of seeing the transformation of a block of stone into a finished sculpture. I had never heard of a Hubbard Squash before spotting one at a, at a market. Now, this is what a Hubbard Squash looks like. In this case, a blue Hubbard Squash. It's kind of football shaped with bumps all over it. Some Hubbard squashes can be more rounded like these and some can even be orange colored. When I saw this blue Hubbard at the market, I had to have it. The owner of a farmer's market stand said that the odd shape of my Hubbard was something he'd never seen before. Something had pressed against the squash as it was growing, causing it to look the way it did. Well, I fell in love with the odd bulging lobes and squat round forms. I grabbed it up in my little arms and brought it to my studio. And here it is, as I found it. Supermarket stickers and all. Well, next I needed to look for the right stone. So while in the process of looking for the right stone, I decided, taking my artistic license, to make the Hubbard squash an orangish color rather than blue. Here at the Complete Sculptor, I found a nice boulder of alabaster agate. And after having it weighed 196 pounds and delivered to my studio, here it is on my work table. Those vertical lines are drill marks made where, when the boulder was split off from a larger boulder. Sometimes sculptors like to keep some of those marks, but because they won't fit with my squash form, I need to get rid of those. So this is how I started, removing the sharp corners. Here I've started to go into the indentations of the drill marks and carve off the stone between them to flatten out the surface. I like to work all over the stone, so I've gone to another section and I'm taking down what doesn't belong. That's what carving is all about, removing what doesn't belong. I discovered to my delight that this particular piece of alabaster has some very large crystals inside. Can you see how rich the color is? Seeing this crystal was very exciting for me. Now that I've blocked the piece, meaning that it's roughly the shape that I wanted, I look at it from all angles. I turn the stone on its side, look at the bottom, the top. Here's another one of those lovely colored crystals. This shows you a close-up of the surface. The chisel marks were made with the aptly named point chisel. It's the chisel that's used to remove large volumes of stone as a piece is roughed out. I block in those lobes that I'm so in love with. I've done more work here and I'm continuing to turn the stone over and over to see it from all angles. The lower part of the piece has to be worked too. For that, I turn it upside down. And as always, I draw on it to help me visualize what I want. During the course of carving this piece, I probably turned it upside down and back at least 25, 30, 40 times. I wouldn't even want to guess how often I turned it on one side or another, just countless times. Details are important. I like to see how the piece sits on its bottom. The curves have to be just right. Often I'd have the actual squash next to me for reference. What I carved is not an exact replica of the original and I don't try to make it so. I like to leave room to take the properties of the stone into consideration. So the piece is a direct carving with the squash as my inspiration. The work you've seen up until now was done through the very early part of March 2020. And then COVID-19 hit. I was away from the studio for about five weeks and when I came back my squash had started to deteriorate. I had originally wanted to carve this circular detail that you see on the bottom but the squash was turning to mush before my very eyes. It got moldy and started to just get soft and squishy. Oh it was very bad. You get the picture. 
Since the top of the squash was still intact, I put a plastic bag under it, under the bottom, to hold the mushiness and cover up the mold. Each day I would pour out the liquid insides of the squash and put it back into a refrigerator. I did this because I still wanted to refer to the top of it, not to copy it, but to capture its essence in the forms that I made. Eventually, of course, I had to let the squash go. Now I'm using a riffler, which is like a nail file for stone to refine the forms. The riffler literally shaves off tiny bits of the stone and gets rid of chisel marks. Now I've gotten the forms the way I want them. It's time for polishing. First, sanding. I sand with water. It cuts down on the dust created, as if I haven't been creating dust all along. Anyway, I wet a section, then use wet, dry sandpaper. Listen to the sound the paper makes as it works. The removed stone creates a slurry with the water and makes a white paste. What I'm doing is removing all the tool marks. As I do this, I can see what the color will be. I wipe off the paste and move to another section. Each time I change to a higher grit, I change the water and put a new towel surface under the piece. This is to keep the piece from being scratched by bits of stone that have been shaved off. Once I've gone over the entire piece with sandpaper, I start all over, all over again with a finer grade of sandpaper. I'll usually start with a 60 grit paper, then move to 80, then 100, 120, 180, 220, each time sanding the entire piece. Sanding is very labor intensive. At this point, I've sanded the whole piece. You can see the color starting to show. At each iteration of sandpaper, uh, the color comes through more and more. Each level of sandpaper removes the scratch marks of the level before it, until the marks are so small that you can't see them. You see the color of the stone. The inset photo shows the stone covered with tool marks. It's essentially whitish colored. You can think of the marks as bruises. The goal is to remove all the bruises in sanding. Ah, now we see the stone's true colors. This inset photo is that crystal I showed you earlier. At the time it was surrounded by tool marks, but it gave me an idea of what to expect. And here the color is in all its glory, a beautiful caramel mixture of swirling color. After sanding, I add a thin coat of wax and the polishing is finished. Using a sculpting compound, I painstakingly fashioned the stalk in the center. Every millimeter of it was formed using the compound, various tiny sculpting tools, and pigments. The inset shows you the stalk that nature made for comparison. It's my hope that this video has given you a general idea of the way I create a piece from start to finish. So now you've gone behind the scenes to see what goes into the making of this piece, Hubbard Squash. I hope you enjoyed this video.